Check it, check, check. Microphone check. One, two. All right, just keep rolling because I've got this in my brain and I just want to start talking about it. So in the edition of Anarchy Moment right before this podcast, I talked about the biggest problem in the universe podcast and Maddox being a statist and earthquakes are good but smoking is bad and earthquakes are good because they cost money and smoking is bad because it costs money. Then I listened to the episode after that and a caller came in and was his comment to Maddox was, how can you be a statist when you think everybody is stupid? You can scream and shout with all your might. Oh, you can scream, shout, whine, cry, snivel, piss, and motherfucking moan. Whatever you want to do. You can shove your opinion up your ass that the Obama's cock has something to keep it company. Don't forget, my friends and my enemies, the ever-present, the most likely third possibility, you are wrong, and I am right. Go fuck yourself. That's how it happens around here. That's how it's been. For 11 motherfucking years of podcasting, I have been right. I have always been right. I will always be right. I am right. I am never wrong. And I can do that because I am the great one himself, founder of the Cynical Libertarian Society, and this is Stating the Obvious Podcast, the weapons platform for which I launched the cruise missile of my intellect. Homes in on a destroyed motherfucking status all around the world has a motherfucking stupidity seeking guidance system in it. Just boom, turn it loose, it fucking automatically locks in on the nearest stupid person, kills them. Any survivors? Any survivors from the nuclear blast we mow down with the machine guns? Anyhow, the caller calls it. I am the great one himself, founder of the saying, over there in the control room is the lovely and adorable Randy. Today is Thanksgiving. It's snowing outside here at the People's Republic of Fort Collins because of global warming. We're all going to die. And you may be wondering, but great one, why are you and Randy at the studio on Thanksgiving? Shouldn't you be at home with your family? Well, my family is all in Texas, and Texas is the place I'd really love to be, except, of course, for the statism. I saw something in the newspaper or online. I haven't looked at a newspaper like any. I saw something somewhere down in Texas. There was a veterinarian who had a website and was like writing about veterinary, you know, medical stuff about animals and occasionally giving advice or something. And the fucking government of Texas came and told him he had to shut up because he's not allowed to give medical advice about animals on the internet. And anyway, the things that he was taking them to a Supreme Court, I don't recall if it was the Supreme Court of Texas or if it was the Supreme Court of the United States. But, you know, here it is, the government of Texas showing up. You, you can't. And I love how people in this country think they have freedom of speech. You people are so fucking stupid that you should be hauled off and exterminated, which will bring us back to Maddox in a minute. But anyway, the point is, why are we, well, I'm at the studio today because all my family is in Texas, which is a good place for them because it keeps them away from me. And Randy is at the studio because she already spent most of yesterday with her family. And how are you feeling? Are you done with them yet? <laughs> yes. You know, there's only so much family time that normal people can handle you quickly reach this point where it's like, okay, that was 17 minutes of family time. I'm ready to move the fuck on now. Yeah, see, there's a reason why we don't all live at home anymore other than the fact that we're not millennials or boomerang kids or anything. Anyway, that's why we're here today. Today is thir Turkey Day and it is still snowing thanks to global warming here in the People's Republic of Fort Collins where we have an ordinance for everything. I got that right here, an ordinance for everything. I might do that in this episode. I'm going to wrap up talking about the greenwash effect. That's what the bulk of this podcast will be about. And my voice is still recovering from not having a voice. You know, it's really actually, it was nice not having a voice for, I think I had five days that I couldn't talk. It was actually kind of cool not having to interact with people and talk to them. And I'm wondering, too, if there's some possibilities for using the I can't talk thing to meet girls. So I might be looking into that. I'll let you know how that works out. Wait, I do have my cup of hot tea. 
I did take the teapot off the burner, so we're not going to start a fire today, in theory. Got my hot tea, got my water jug. Don't have any booze yet. It's still early in the morning. Well, there's no such thing as early in the morning when it comes to drinking. All right, let's talk about Maddox. So the caller calls in and says, Maddox, how can you be such a fucking statist? You didn't say fuck. Actually, if you haven't listened to the podcast, there is a lot of bad language. But he says, how can you be such a statist? You want the government to control all of this stuff, make people's decisions, yet you're always talking about how dumb everybody is. And Maddox was re Maddox's response to this, it's not a live call in. People call in, they have a number where you can call in and leave a voice message, which if they like it, they'll play on the show. Many of which are fucking hilarious as shit. Again, biggest problem in the universe podcast, absolutely hilarious. If you're not listening to it, I really recommend you go check it out. It is well worth your time. Very well produced and funnier than shit. I disagree with, Ma I disagree with Maddox a lot, but it's still funnier than shit. Okay. And Maddox responded to this by saying, I don't think everybody is dumb. I think most people are dumb, but there's a lot of people who are really smart. And this brings up an important thing to understand about anarcho-capitalist versus statist. Especially in the sense that statists are the ones who can't shut the fuck up about how everyone is equal and nobody is better than anybody else and all this other stuff. To be a statist, you do in fact have to believe that some people are better than other people. Some people are smarter than other people. Some people are more competent and more capable than other people. You have to believe that to be a statist. To be a statist and to say there should be this one person, the President of the United States, who has the ability to do these things, like to send, there should be one person allowed to make the decision to send the United States military into another country to kill people, or one person who should make the decision to launch nuclear weapons and blow up the planet Earth. Now, for you, if you're a statist, for a statist to believe that there's one person who should have that kind of power, they must obviously believe that one person is smarter than other people in society. Right? When I say to you on this podcast that people who support Obama, voted for Obama, yada yada, believe he is a god, believe that he is this great entity that can do no wrong. This is the truth. You have to believe that because if you in fact believe all humans are equally stupid, then you would be an anarcho-capitalist. This is my entire fucking thesis behind this podcast. Everybody is stupid. Well, my thesis behind, and not just my thesis, the thesis behind anarcho-capitalism. Everyone is equally stupid. That's why you don't give a small group of people or a single person large amounts of power because there aren't these magical unicorn people who are somehow so smart and intelligent that they can handle having control of the nuclear weapons while other people can't. So a statist, any statist out there, by virtue of being a statist, is asserting that yes, there are some people who are so smart that they can make everybody else's decisions for them. When you look at Plato's Republic, when you look at all of these utopia fantasies, all the people who think that scientists should run society, right? These are all people, the, the fucking global warming wackos. To bring this back to the greenhouse effect, these are people who think that Politicians and scientists are so much smarter than everyone else that they should be able to decide who's allowed to have electricity and how much electricity you can use and how many resources you can have and what your carbon footprint should be and all this other stuff. To be a statist, you must believe there are other people who are smarter than the 99% and therefore can make the decisions 
for the 99%. When you come to the realization that all humans are stupid in some ways, that all humans are flawed, that no humans are perfect, that power corrupts regardless of who you give that power to, that's when you become an anarcho-capitalist. Again, the statist believes that power corrupts, but some people can have power and not be corrupted. Right when George Bush was president of the United States, well, he was corrupt and evil, and he did, you know, he favored the corporations and all this. Stuff. But when Obama became president, well, he, you know, he's a unicorn. He's perfect. He's beyond corruption. He's a demigod. He's a what, what, there was that article. Oh, and I'm going to put, I need to put the blueprint for change on the website. I did a little updating on the website. Over on the reading list page, I added some more science studies and research papers and stuff. And I also found my PDF of Hussein Obama's blueprint for change, which I need to post so that you can go and read that and see how many of the things he promised he's actually fought, came through on. Guantanamo Bay, still open last time I checked. But anyhow, I was saying something. I already forgot what I was saying. Randy, was I saying anything important? I was just babbling. All right. Oh, 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 oh. An enlightened being. That's it. There was that article written about Obama before he got elected, which is on, the web, is on my website somewhere. I freaking have the link to the original and I have the text reproduced. It's in the archive section. But this fucking, you know, stoner idiot New Ager wrote this article about how Obama is, and I'm not making this up, Obama is an enlightened being who's better than the rest of us. I mean, he says that. He's not, he says Obama is an enlightened being who is better than the rest of us. He says it. And this, to be a statist, you have to believe that. You have to believe that there are other people out there who are enlightened and who are better than you are and therefore should make your choices for you. And of course, this is another way of the statist affirming that they recognize that they are inferior. When you're saying other people are better than you, what you're also saying is that you are inferior to those people. And as I've said before, statists are in fact inferior. Natural selection would have removed them from the gene pool, but the state keeps them alive because the state needs people who need the state in order to survive. This is why the state makes sure the more incompetent, the more inferior you are, the more wealth redistribution you receive, the more legal protection you receive, the more handouts you receive, and the more you get to vote. All right, enough of that. We, I've, I've covered that. In case you didn't get it, statists, by definition, have to believe that other people are better than they are. Anarcho-capitalists, by definition, are those of us who recognize that everyone is equally intelligent and equally stupid, and that the really stupid people should be removed from the gene pool by natural selection. All right, let's get back to the book. Let's wrap this up. Again, this book is The Greenwash Effect, Corporate Deceit, Celebrity Environmentalist, and What Big Business Isn't Telling You About Their Green Products and Brands. It's written by Guy Pierce. This is part three of two, which is what I always put in the thing. So I always think, oh, it's going to be a two-parter. It turns out to be a three-parter. This is part three in the series. If you haven't heard the first two, you can go listen to them. Again, this is a very good book. It's a little repetitive because basically it's the same thing over and over. He says, here's a corporation. Here's what they say they're doing. Here's what they're really doing. They're a bunch of lying motherfuckers. Here's a celebrity. Here's what he says he's doing. Here's what he's really doing. He's a lying motherfucker. So in that sense, it's a little repetitive, but it's an easy read. It's an interesting read. It's an educational read. And it's all the best, again, because Guy Pierce is a global warming wacko. He actually thinks global warming is real. And so when global warming wackos attack people who claim to be green, it has a lot more impact with other global warming wackos than when I attack people who claim to be green. Because obviously, I'm an anarcho-capitalist. I don't believe in global warming. And therefore, obviously, I hate women. I hate children. I hate black people. I hate homosexuals and all that other good stuff. Mm. 
I do have her like hot tea. This is, what is this? This is cherry zinger. All right, we're up to the conclusion of the book. And I am on page 239, second paragraph. And I also appreciate that when I got to the conclusion of the book, and I apologize for the voice. I know I'm cutting out a little bit here and there. I've still got a little bit of after effects. I appreciate, again, I really appreciate Guy Pierce having a high degree of intellectual honesty, especially for a global warming wacko. This is, it's, it's refreshing to find a global warming wacko who isn't completely stupid. And you'll hear some of that in the things I'm going to read here. All right, 239, second paragraph. After more than a decade of green marketing campaigns in response to public concern about climate change, we might reasonably expect impressive results. Yet almost no major company examined here can credibly say that its overall carbon footprint is getting smaller. For the footprint of a big brand to be shrinking, all the emissions associated with the products it sells need to be shrinking. That's what matters to the atmosphere. Yet as soon as we factor in the emissions that the companies disown, those from the supply chain, and use of products, their claim to climate friendliness collapses. As we've seen, for many of the world's big brands, from Kraft to Levi's to Walmart, these emissions often account for 90% or more of their total carbon footprint. And again, this just, as I've said over and over and over, and as all of you idiots out there ignore, yeah, supply chain, yeah, all the environmental, just like with your little fucking Prius, all the environmental destruction involved in getting the heavy metals out of the earth, transporting them, transporting your Prius. I, you know, I drive an electric car. It has zero emissions. No, when you plug it in and you fucking charge it, that electricity you're using comes from burning coal. But it's, again, it's the fucking... It's this world where people only see what's in front of them, which is interesting because at the same time, all of these people claim to be so fucking intelligent and insightful, and yet they're not capable of understanding that just because they don't see something, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Page 241. First paragraph. So how do so how do the big brands get away with their carbon scams? Well, the now familiar tricks of the trade play an important part. Slogans and logos. A few green products advertised heavily but made in very small numbers. Impressive sounding emissions intensity targets. Boast about saving tens of millions of tons of carbon dioxide versus what would have otherwise occurred even when this still involves an overall increase. Conspicuous renewable energy installations at company headquarters. Vocal speeches by the CEO. A glossy sustainability report full of isolated instances of green success stories. Enthusiastic participation in coalitions lobbying government to be greener. A voluntary carbon offset program for customers. Switching off for Earth Hour. Yes, all of those public relations bullshit tactics work. And they all allow these companies to pretend they are creating less pollution when they're actually creating more pollution. But ultimately, what allows the big brands to get away with what he calls their carbon scams? Ultimately, what allows this to happen is the stupidity of the average person. The stupidity of the 99%. The stupidity of those of you whose DNA should not be in the gene pool. The stupidity of those of you who are statist. Again, you know the old saying, you can't have a democracy without an educated population. Educated? Oh, maybe so, because education and intelligence are not the same. I can tell you this for a fact. You cannot have a democracy 
with an intelligent population because an intelligent population doesn't need a democracy. An intelligent population understands supply chains. An intelligent population understands that when you plug in your electric car, you're using your electricity, which was generated by burning coal. An intelligent population doesn't fall for bullshit like global warming. Page 242, last paragraph. For environmental groups that coin slogans such as the clean revolution is underway and the sustainable revolution will be branded, it's time to reconsider whether cheering on the revolution, however fake, will somehow make it real. Many of the worst offenders we've looked at have been lauded by or even collaborated with the WWF, Conservation International, the Climate Group, or other prominent environmental groups. Often this relationship involves significant sums of money changing hands, and in a surprising number of cases, it also involves senior corporate leaders sitting on the boards of the environmental groups concerned. And of course it does, because environmental groups do not exist to save the environment. Environmental groups exist to make money. Environmental groups exist because there are people who are figured out they can get paid money by stupid people for sitting around talking about saving the earth and then they don't have to go out and get real jobs. And then of course it's much of this is the same as regulatory capture. right? When you create a government agency to regulate an industry, well that industry will immediately begin trying to influence the regulatory agency and get people in the regulatory agency in order to make regulations that benefit the industry, not hinder it. That's regulatory capture. I mean, it's the same thing here. When you've got some wacko environmentalist group like the WWF or Conservation International or the Climate Group or whatever, and they go out and they start saying, well, these corporations are green and these aren't and all this other shit. At that point, the corporations have an incentive to give these uh, environmental groups money to get people within the environmental groups to essentially engage in regulatory capture in order to get the WWF and Conservation International and the Climate Group to say, oh, this corporation, they're so green. So you end up with another form of regulatory capture. Page 245, last paragraph. Mm -hmm. No, I'm reading ahead. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I want to make sure I'm reading the right thing here. You now, my notes are sometimes sketchy. Okay, yeah, I'm on it. From cars we drive to the iPhones we use to tell people about the cars, from the food we eat to the appliances we use to keep it cool, a personal plume of invisible greenhouse pollution extends largely offshore and is largely unclaimed by us. We are all using the developing world as a carbon waste dump much more than we acknowledge. Ah, where have you heard this before? I wonder if I've said this. And while rising population and affluence in these countries is driving emissions growth, so too, so too is consumption in developed countries. None of this means that we should stop buying or stop buying the greener product, but it does mean we need to be realistic about the brand behind the products and about the impact our purchases make. And there, my friends, is an excellent example of woman logic. He acknowledges that our affluence and rising population is creating more pollution because we buy more, more and more shit. But of course, none of this means that we should stop buying. No, actually it does. People who buy a new fucking iPhone every goddamn time a new iPhone comes out just because they need it as a status symbol because 
their lives are so fucking empty and meaningless and worthless that they should actually be dead in order to make the world a better place and reduce pollution? No. These people should stop buying. You don't need a new fucking iPhone. And, and remember, the Apple users are always the most fucking liberal, progressive, left-wing, statist, tree-hugging, environmentalist, cocksucking pieces of shit in any group of people. Right? You bring me a hundred random Android users and a hundred random iPhone users, and we sort of average up their political score. We could figure out how we're doing that. I guarantee you the iPhone faggots are going to be further to the left than the Android idiots. I promise you, Apple users are among the fucking stupidest people on the planet. I have the podcast about why Mac users are stupid. Still one of the most popular podcasts I've ever put out because you all know it's true. I can't. Use, I need. I use a Mac because it's so easy. Cause Windows, you have to click on an icon twice. It's so hard for me to use Windows. I can't do it. I need a Mac. So no, 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 dumbass. No, this does mean you should stop buying. It means you should stop consuming so much shit. You don't need a new TV every fucking however often you buy one. You buy a fucking TV, you use it till it breaks. You don't need a fucking new iPhone every time a new iPhone comes out. You don't need a new iPad every time a new iPad comes out. You don't need all those fucking shoes. You don't need all this stuff. No, you fucking dumbass. It means exactly that you fucking environmentalist wacko morons, if you really believed in global warming, would stop buying so much shit. If you really care about less pollution, every fucking piece of shit you buy creates pollution. All of it. Every fucking bit of it. Everything. There is not one single fucking thing you can exchange money for, except maybe sex, that does not create pollution. Pollution is a byproduct of existing, which brings us back to why I've always said, if you're an environmentalist wacko and you believe in overpopulation and global warming and all this other shit, the best thing you can do to save the earth is to fucking kill yourself. Because as long as you are alive, you are destroying the environment. It's just woman logic. It's pure fucking woman logic. All the stuff these corporations are creating are having a carbon footprint and destroying the earth, but that doesn't mean we should stop buying their products. It's like saying, well, we know for a fact that Jews in concentration camps are being gassed and they're being killed, but that doesn't mean we should stop sending Jews to concentration camps. No, no dumbass. That's exactly what the fuck it means. If Jews in concentration camps are being killed, then yes, you stop sending Jews to the concentration camp. We're assuming now, of course, that the result you're looking for is Jews to not be killed. Same thing here. You want to reduce the amount of carbon put into the atmosphere by corporations that are selling shit, then yes, the answer is stop buying the shit the corporations produce. Huh? But you can't do that, can you? Because you're a fucking environmentalist wacko and you're so goddamn dumb that you can't use a fucking Windows computer because you have to click on the icon twice. Page 252. fuck am I reading here? 252, last first paragraph. Oh, here we go. So this is the epilogue. <clears throat> 
What has been more surprising than the corporate reaction? Do I need to read the corporate reaction? Look at this. Mm. Actually, I think I will. I'm jumping backwards here. The reaction to the book, the book, he's referring to this book right here. The reaction to the book has been revealing in its own way. In short, the notion that the world's greenest looking companies are still heading in the wrong direction seems pretty unwelcome. Predictably, I suppose, the companies whose greenwash is exposed here were not about to draw attention to the criticism. Interesting though, interestingly though, almost none has challenged the claims made. HSBC was the only large company to dispute anything I said, clarifying that while HSBC investment advisors might recommend that investors buy into fossil fuel companies, the vast majority of shares held in such companies by HSBC are ultimately owned by others. Beyond that, a polite acknowledgement from Puma and a constructive exchange with the founder of Green and Black's Chocolate, I have not heard a peep from any of the major brands. Even with a North American edition publicly advertised as forthcoming for close to a year, no companies have found anything sufficiently worrying enough to even seek an amendment in this new edition. So, no legal threats, no denials in the media, just the stony silence of PR and legal professionals who know that the criticism is not worth responding to while it has no media traction. It's of course possible that some companies didn't notice the book, but probably unlikely given how many companies I peppered with questions during the research phase. And it, you have to think about this. This is an interesting point. He's written this book in which he names corporations, he names people's names, he gives numbers, he calls all of these people liars right there to their faces. He throws it down. He like he pulls his fucking dick out and like just sticks it right in the face of the CEOs of these corporations and he waves it around and then he pees on them. I mean, he and nobody's arguing with it. Not one as he says, just totally ignoring him. I find that interesting because what that tells me is that none of these companies are slightly concerned about the fact that they're lying cocksuckers on, when it comes to greenwashing coming to light. None of them care. And why do they not care? I know why they don't care. They don't care because it doesn't matter ultimately. You sheeple, you statist, you inferior people who acknowledge that other people are your superiors and should make your decisions for you, those of you who should be removed from the gene pool, those of you who are some, you're inferior. Now it's me getting a drink of tea. Those of you who are inferior are not going to stop buying stuff. All of these corporations and the celebrities in here that he exposed, yada, 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 none of you are going to stop consuming their stuff. It doesn't matter whether Sony is bullshitting you about their emissions. You're still going to buy a Blu-ray player. You're still going to buy a television. It doesn't matter if Apple's bullshitting about their <clears throat> emissions you're still going to buy the new iPhone. It doesn't matter if George Clooney is a piece of shit who has a carbon footprint the size of a small third world country. You're still going to go see his movies. And all these corporations and celebrities, they know this. That's why they don't give a shit. That's why they're not responding. They know it doesn't matter. Nothing is going to stop you idiots from spending money on shit because the fucking coping mechanisms exist for you, right? You go out, you buy your DVD player, you ignore 
all of the carbon footprint generated in the transportation, the production, the fact that you're using it, all this other shit. And then you take your plastic water bottle, which was driven across the country in a truck, spewing out fossil fuel fumes, and you take that plastic bottle and you throw it in the recycle bin and you, you're born again. You've been cleansed. You've been saved. You're just like these fucking Christians who go out and they sin, right? You know, some chick goes out and fucks a bunch of guys or some guy goes out and sucks a guy's dick or you know, whatever. And they go and they, oh, Jesus, forgive me. And Jesus forgives them. And oh, they're born again. It's like they never sinned. It's so none of this matters because you people always have the redemption process of recycling. And that's exactly what it is. It's exactly like being born again when you're a Christian. You sin, you go get born again, and oh, everything's okay. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that I fucked 17 guys in one night. It doesn't matter that I'm a homosexual and God says fags are going to burn in hell or whatever the fuck. You know, none of it matters. I'm born again. And it's the same thing with you fucking environmentalist pieces of shit. You engage in all of these activities, you buy all of this stuff, you destroy the fucking environment, you put pollution into the environment, but then you take your fucking plastic water bottle and you throw it in the recycle bin and oh, you are again pure. You have been purged of your carbon footprint. So now let me read the other paragraph that I was starting with. What has been more surprising than the corporate reaction has been the reaction elsewhere. For various reasons, the book received little media coverage in Australia. My various shortcomings as a media talent and aversion to self-promotion no doubt contributed, as did the heavy emphasis on global brands. Austra I, I, I don't know this for a fact. I think Guy Pierce is from Australia. Oh, yeah, it says right here. Guy Pierce is an author and columnist whose four previous books focus heavily on how politicians and corporations mislead the public about their response to major environmental concerns. He is a former political advisor, lobbyist, and speechwriter. Pierce lives in the Sunshine Coast hinterland in Queensland, Austria. Austria. Australia. Austria and Australia are two different fucking places. So the book, my understanding is that the book was originally released in Australia and then released in the United States a year or possibly more than one year later. So that's why he's referencing Australia. Promotional, as did the heavy emphasis on global brands, Australian media would have no doubt preferred a critique of local companies. Even so, there was enough coverage for the book to reach much of the market one might expect to be interested. Environmentalists, marketing agencies, academics, politicians, and bureaucrats. Wow, all of, all, some of the biggest fucking pieces of scum on the planet Earth, right there. Environmentalists, marketing agencies, academics, politicians, and bureaucrats. There's five groups of people whose DNA should be removed from the gene pool, and five groups of people that wouldn't exist in an anarcho-capitalist society. Okay, anyway. For good measure, the University of Queensland's Queensland, with which I am affiliated, well, excuse me, which with, bleh, with which I was affiliated when the book was released, mailed around 200 copies to a wide range of thought leaders, thought leaders is in quotes as it should be, thought leaders around the world. Again, to think that there are people who are thought leaders, you have to be a statist. Wow, I need people to lead my thinking. Okay, if you need other people to lead your thinking, that's an indicator you should be dead. When you use words like thought leader and you're not using it to make fun of something, that's an indicator you should be dead. Mailed around 200 copies to a wide range of thought leaders around the world. Corporate sustainability gurus, a group of people that should be dead. Climate policy wonks, group of people that should be dead. Political leaders, a group of people that should be... Remember, these are the people he thinks are thought leaders. These are all groups of people that should be dead. But he thinks these people are thought leaders. These are the people that Guy Pierce, as a statist environmentalist wacko piece of shit, 
thinks should be leading other people's thoughts. Corporate sustainability gurus, climate policy wonks, political leaders, eminent environmentalists, and academics. There were two or three cursory acknowledgments, but beyond that, there has been almost no reaction and certainly no fallout. The lack of interest from environmental activists was especially surprising. Not to me, it wasn't. Why would environmentalist activists give a shit about this? Environmentalist activists all buy products. They buy Blu-ray players. They buy televisions. They buy cars. They buy iPhones. There's no surprise here. There's no fucking surprise here. No surprise. Not to anybody with a brain cell. The book provides a swath of material that might easily become the basis for an ongoing campaign to expose greenwash, but there seems to be little interest in that. There seems to be little interest in that. I think I slurred that sentence because I'm an idiot. The impression I'm left with is that people don't really want to know. They don't want to believe that the greenest looking brands are increasingly climate unfriendly. Perhaps it's just too unhappy a narrative. If the green corporate pinups are failing the planet, what hope is there? No, no, it has nothing to do with... It, it, it has to do with the fact that they don't give a shit. You don't understand, guy. Yeah, I'm not your guy, buddy. I'm not your buddy, pal. I'm not your pal, guy. Look, Guy Pierce, you don't fucking get it, man. You don't fucking get it. No one gives a shit because these people don't give a shit. Most of them recognize there's no such thing as global warming. Most of them know they're only in this shit because it's a religion. It gives them fucking emotional comfort and all this other stuff. But even the ones who really think global warming is real, again, right? they're just like the fucking Christians. They believe in sin, but they don't believe in sin enough to avoid sinning. Global warming wackos, environmentalist wackos, oh, they believe that we're all going to die and pollution, but they don't believe it enough to not buy the latest iPhone. Because ultimately, their personal comfort is more important to them than anything else. There's no surprise here that your book did not create a stir. There are none. Again it's, a, it's again, it's a great book, man. You people should read this. The Greenwash Effect by Guy Pierce. P-E-A-R-S-E is how he spells his last name. It's a great book. It's a very good book. But nobody gives a shit. Not one fucking environmentalist wacko is going to read this book and then stop buying shit. Not one... In, what, it's just, you're not going to, there's nothing here you can change. Because people are selfish. Except, of course, for those enlightened thought leaders like Obama. Now, see, Obama, he's not selfish. And that's why he's an enlightened being. And it's okay for him to be the president. And okay for him to be commander-in-chief. And okay for him to be able to launch nuclear weapons. Because he's so much better than everyone else. Randy, how are we on time? Oh, perfect. This is working out well. Let's talk about... Let's talk about People's Republic of Fort Collins. Where we have an ordinance for everything. That's a saying we have around here. Fort Collins, we have an ordinance for everything. Because they do. We have ordinances about smoking and just everything in existence. So we get this little city news thing that comes with the electric bill. Let me read a couple of things to you here. Sidewalk snow removal. Because Fort Collins is a pedestrian-friendly community in every season, residents are required to clear sidewalks of all snow and ice following storms. If a sidewalk is not cleared within 24 hours after the end of snow accumulation, the city may have the walk cleared and bill the property owner. Hey, it's snowing right now. I'll be able to test it. I have lived in the same place for over 10 years. 
the recording studio for the Cynical Libertarian Society has... Wait, have we? I, yeah, I guess I, I... Yeah. I guess I have lived in the same place the whole time we've been reporting this podcast. Reporting this podcast. Recording this podcast. So I've been in the same place for 11 years. And the studio has been in the same place for... How long have we had the studio? Eight years? I, I, have, I have no clue. Six years? doesn't matter. The point is, I've been here for a while. I can tell you, the sidewalks, after it snows, never get shoveled. Never get cleared. And it's been this way for ten fucking years. So I find it interesting that we have these laws, these ordinances that say you have to shovel the snow off your sidewalk. And yet, it never happens. And I'm pretty sure nobody's getting billed, or if they are getting billed, the bill can't be very much. When you have laws that you can't enforce, first of all, it's stupid. Second of all, it makes you look like an idiot. Right? It's kind of like... It's like if you've ever had a job where the boss comes out and says, not that I have any jobs where this happens. You know, when the boss comes out and says, well, you can't do such and such. And then people do such and such, and he doesn't do anything about it. Same thing, man. You know, if you're go- when when you look at the state and the state, the local government has these laws, but they never get enforced. It just makes you look dumb. It makes the state look dumb, and it points out the fact that there are all of these laws that can't be enforced. And in a sense, it gives us hope, because when you start to recognize that there are so many laws, so many regulations, so many ordinances that the government, at any level, the local, the state, the federal, can't possibly enforce them. You know, it points out the futility of what the state is trying to do with all the regular, but it also points a path to the future where there's going to be more and more and more surveillance and more and more enforcement because eventually governments are going to have to either start letting go of these laws or start cracking down. Here's another ordinance we have. As we get into cold weather, if you must burn, and we're talking about burning wood in your fireplace or Let me just read the whole thing. Keep the smoke clear this fall. Did you know that one out of every four days, Fort Collins violates the state's visibility standard? The state of Colorado has a law about visibility. Really? While wood smoke contributes to the brown cloud, it can be even more damaging in the neighborhood where it's burning. The city recommends that you avoid using your fireplace or wood stove to protect the health of yourself and your neighbors. <gasps> wow. Because see, it's, ooh, it, it's for health. You know what else would be useful to protect people's health? If they weren't fat. As we get into cold weather, if you must burn, keep these city code requirements in mind. Again, these are laws. You have to ask yourself, if you violate these, is the government going to show up and do what? Give you a ticket? If you don't pay the ticket, are they going to arrest you? Will they put you in jail? If you resist going to jail, will they taser you? Will they beat you? Will they kill you? Remember, you're threatening people with violence. You are ultimately... (coughs) You are ultimately threatening people with violence for not shoveling their snow or for burning wood in their fireplace. But we live in a free country. That's the important part. Residents may bur- residents may only burn clean, dry, untreated wood. Okay, what's the definition of clean? How dry is dry? Manufactured fire logs are permitted. Burning garbage or treated wood is not. Maintaining a small Maintain a small, hot fire. We're going to tell you what kind of fire to have. How hot is hot? How small is small? 
After the first 15 minutes of startup, chimney smoke must be at 20% opacity or less, which means that the smoke should be barely, vis barely visible when looking at it with your back to the sun. For more information about the code requirements and impacts of wood smoke, visit fcgov.com slash wood smoke. Fort Collins, where we have laws about the smoke coming out of your chimney. Holy shit, Sherlock. All right. Let's go out on this. Oh, wait, I need that. I need that for doing the show notes. I'm fucking throwing shit in the trash and I still need it. Where's my show notes pile? There it is. Let's go out on this. I am watching a television miniseries. I'm assuming it's it's four parts. I'm assuming this is the whole series. I don't know yet because I'm not finished with it yet. I read about it on a website and checked it out. It's called Ascension. So far, it's pretty good. Of course, it has some plot holes in it and it has some things where it's like, well, that couldn't really be... That wouldn't really work if that, you know, it's, it's TV. It is what it is. Nothing's perfect. As they say over at Cinema Sins, no movie is without sin. By the way, if you don't, check, if you don't know about it, check out Cinema Sins over on YouTube. They do, what he does is, it's not, really, it's not reviews, but he goes through movies and he does what me and my friend do when we watch movies together, he goes through and he picks out all of the what he calls sins, all the things that you know wouldn't work or don't make sense or the cliches and all this. It's a fucking hilarious YouTube channel. It's really good. He has shit tons of videos. So if you like that kind of thing, go check it out. Highly, highly recommended. Anyhow, Ascension, the premise of Ascension is that in the 1960s, the government of the United States, the military, because it's a secret, launched a generational starship that's traveling to another star. It's going to take them 101 years to get there. And it's 51 years into the voyage. So you've got this starship, which is slightly larger than the Empire State Building, blasting through space, heading for Proxima Centauri with about 600 people on it. And as it kicks off, a girl on the starship is murdered, and things go from there. And of course, there are some revelations, and things aren't quite what they seem. I'm not going to give anything away. So far, it's good. I'm enjoying it. I recommend watching it. It's, it's a nice little ride. And I'm always right, so that's my opinion about the movie, so you should watch the movie, because I said it was good, and I'm always right, therefore, it must be good. Spot, where's my ship? Where's my shatter? Personation, go!